Well, hello everyone. This is Pastor Glenn from Chapmanville Community Church. Welcome to our weekend service for the second weekend of February. This is Valentine's Day weekend and wherever you are, I just want to say happy Valentine's Day. I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. You say he does. How much does he love me? Well, he loves you enough that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to live on this earth, to die for your sins and for mine. He paid for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He ascended into heaven, and someday he's coming back for you and for me if we've accepted him. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? It happens when you admit that you're a sinner. When you acknowledge that you are a sinner, that God is righteous and you are a sinner, but you also realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for your sins. You cannot work into salvation. It is what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me. And to accept that and to receive that and believe that he died, believe that he paid for your sins, believe that he rose again. If you do that, the Bible says that you are forgiven and that you are saved. God wants to save you. If you haven't accepted him, I pray that you would today and that you would understand the greatest Valentine's gift of all time, Jesus Christ. But wherever you are, it is great to be able to have you here today to join with us. I have a couple announcements for us. First of all, if you haven't already heard, we are resuming in-person uh, church services this weekend. February 14th at 1045 a.m. We're continuing uh, coming back and having in church services with this stipulation. Masks are required. Masks are required for everyone following the guidelines of the state. You say, well, other places aren't doing it. We're not other places. It's the decision that we made because we care about you and we want to honor the government, the authority that God has placed over us but we still wanna be able to get together. So masks are required. We have uh, the seats divided up for social distancing. We are asking everyone to follow that as well because we wanna be able to come back together for the fellowship, for the worship, for the singing together, for the encouraging of one another. But we look forward to being able to see you. And if you can't come now, we hope that you'll be able to come sometime down the road. If you are sick, uh, if you've been around somebody that's had COVID or that you've had, you have it and you're still in quarantine um, or you're not feeling well or you're just worried about it, please stay home. Stay home, watch this online uh, to be able to uh, still be able to participate this way. And when, when you feel better, when you're healthier and you're able to join us, we look forward to being able to have that happen. But uh, for those that are able to come, we look forward to being able to see you for Sunday service whenever you're able to be here uh, this week or one of the weeks to come. The second announcement I have for you is Love Inc. is doing a chicken and biscuit drive through luncheon um, on Sunday, February 14th. Perfect opportunity. It's $8 a plate down in Titusville across from the park in the parking lot right beside Love Inc. And um, it's eight bucks a plate, great opportunity, starts at 11 a.m. and goes to 3 p.m. It's a great organization. If you're able to go down, please participate. Please take advantage of that. You will bless them and you'll bless the community and you'll have a good meal in the process. So those are my two announcements for you today. And I hope that uh, hope you're able to take part in one or both of those. A passage of scripture I'd like to read for us today is found in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Just verse 27. It's the passage I'm memorizing and working at memorizing. Why don't you read this along with me? Jeremiah 32, verse 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Will you join me in prayer? Father God, I thank you for this passage today. You are the Lord. You are the God of all flesh, whether we acknowledge it or not. And there is nothing that is too hard for you. God, I, I pray today, I pray today for friends that are dealing with COVID right now as I've got word of a, um, a 
of a family that's dealing with it. God, I pray that you would heal their bodies and protect them from this being worse than it could be. But I know that you can heal them. I know you can protect them and others around them. And so I ask God that you would do exactly that. I also know, God, that there are those who have just really struggled. They've struggled with not being able to be together with family and friends, and they need to hear from you. They need your, your presence and your love today. On this Valentine's Day, God, I pray you would pour your spirit out on hearts and lives that each one of us would recognize and understand the extent that you love us and that we would receive that, receive that gift of your son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins. Open our hearts, open our eyes. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in individuals, in all of us today. And God, as we turn to your word today, I pray that your spirit would be our teacher the battle is raging and we need to be suited up with your armor. God, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes to see what is going on around us and that we would be prepared as you have prepared us. May you get the glory and the praise. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Well, we're continuing a series that we are in right now uh, in the book of e uh, um, yeah, Ephesians chapter 6. Lost my thought there for a second. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, I've titled this little series, Prepared for the Battle. Prepared for the B Battle. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, that's where we're going to be today. Um, you may remember that uh, last week we, we finished up with verse 13. I'll put it up just to kind of remind us and segue into the, today's passage. Verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I made reference to this last week, but Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, is, is really very clear. Take up the whole armor of God. Uh, if we think about it in terms of, uh, of somebody going onto the football field, you'd never see a football player going out for you know, the first play wearing only a helmet and a jersey and a pair of pants, no pads below the neck. You'd say, well, that guy's going to get killed out there. Why? Because you have to put on the whole uniform, all of the pads, if you intend to protect your body and be able to compete successfully. And Paul says here, he says, listen, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that we will be able to withstand, that we'll be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand, that we will stand, that we will endure that we will be able to endure and resist. And that's the, that's the goal. If we don't put on the whole armor of God, how can we expect to, to be able to resist the devil and his attacks? How can we expect to endure uh, when trials and struggles and the battle comes? No, we need to, we need to put on the whole armor of God. And Paul, Paul was a prisoner. And, and think of this for a second. Paul was a prisoner when he wrote this letter. This is one of his prison epistles. Epistle means a letter. So it's a letter that he wrote while he was in prison. And, and most believe he was either, uh, it was when he was either in prison in Caesarea or he was in prison in Rome. And, and most scholars believe that it was when he was in prison at Rome. But you can almost imagine, can't you, that Paul's in prison and there would be guards and centurions walking around. And he's, as he's writing the letter to the, uh, to the church at Ephesus, he sees a Roman centurion. And as he does through, through the Holy Spirit, he all of a sudden recognizes the different pieces of armor that the soldier wears and sees the correlation for the armor that you and I wear. Here's a picture that I found um, uh, painted in, in 1927. Uh, I found it, a gentleman named Mike Bishop had put it on the internet and I give credit for him for putting it out there to be able to, to use this way. But 
But as Paul is writing and, and seeing this Roman soldier, I, I can almost see him saying, yeah, yeah, that's what the Christian armor really looks like. And if you look at that picture, you can, you can see the area where the girdle or the belt is and the breastplate and the, the sandals or the shoes. And, and you can see his shield and you can see his helmet and you can see his sword. But, but friends, here's the point. These are human weapons. Paul is writing this as if it's a parable. It's a, it's a, a metaphor using an example before the people of Ephesus and us and the readers of this, of this passage, um, a picture in our mind. But he's not trying to tell us about armor from, from a, uh, a physical, earthly standpoint. No, his real goal is that he is trying to teach us about spiritual things. And since the, since the enemy is spiritual, as we said last week, and that the battle is always spiritual, we need not physical armor that we could go and buy at an army surplus store, but we need, we need the armor of the Lord. Um, in fact, I think that Paul's real lesson was to teach us these things. He was trying to teach us about truth. How does truth help us in the middle of the battle? How does righteousness equip us and prepare us and protect us in the battle? How does the gospel bring peace into our lives when the battle is raging? Where does faith come in in our lives as, as spiritual warfare is underway? Where is salvation in God's plan as protection for spiritual Warfare and, and what about the Word of God? Where, where does that play? How does that play in? See, this is the real armor of God. But if you try to see this with your eyes, you can't. It's not visible to the human eye. In fact, I would say, as the title of this lesson is, it is the invisible armor of God. As I was reading this week and studying, I, I referenced back to 1 Samuel and um, read where David was fighting Goliath. You remember as he was preparing to go out onto the battlefield to face Goliath, this little shepherd boy, he was armed with um, a sling and five stones and a pouch. And, and, and um, Saul tried to give David Saul's armor. But David said, I can't use that because I haven't tested it. I haven't tried it. And instead, if you read that passage, he depends fully and wholly on the Lord his God. And I believe that David went out there armed with the armor of God. And, and when you and I are armed with the armor of God, it is better it is more durable, it is more protection than any physical armor could ever be. Why? Because we're doing spiritual warfare and it's a whole different kind of warfare. If we want to withstand and resist in the evil day, if we want to stand and endure the battles and the, and the spiritual warfare that comes, Friends, you and I need to put on the whole armor of God. Well, let's look at the passage today as we get into this. Ephesians chapter 6, looking at verse 14. The very first thing that I see is stand still. Stand still. Look at verse 14 with me. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with, the tru with truth, having put on the breastplate of of righteousness. The first words that I have underlined there are stand therefore. The word stand that is here, I'm standing on the stage here in the church. The place is empty. I'm here by myself, and uh, but I'm standing here. But this word is not just to, I'm, stand, I'm standing here. It's not the act of just standing wherever you happen to be. I stand and lean up against the wall. That's not what this is. No, the word means to set, to place, to, to establish, or to make your stand. 
Here's the one that I really like. You may want to write this one down. To hold one's ground. That's what it means. When I was a kid and uh, going to school over in Townville, um, oftentimes in the winter time, like this time of the year, there would be piles of snow. And the boys would be out on the playground and we would play a game called King of the Hill. And somebody would climb up to the top of the hill and the goal was to stand your ground to knock anybody else off and see how long you could stand your ground. You just didn't stand up there, la, 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 la. No, no, that wasn't it. You stood your ground. When somebody was trying to climb the hill and get you, you'd get your feet ready. You'd, you'd kind of dig in a little bit and you'd watch for them coming up and you would stand your ground to hold your ground. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, we find the same word used in Exodus chapter 14. Moses and Israel, they've, they've, uh, uh, the children of Israel, they've left Egypt. They're heading out into the wilderness. They're heading to the promised land. They, they get to the Red Sea. The waters part. They cross over and, and all of a sudden the Egyptians are coming up and the children of Israel are totally freaking out. Why? Because the enemy's coming. And in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, Moses says some of the most profound words for them, but for us too as we deal with spiritual warfare. Read this together with me. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Here it is. Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I love this passage. So many times we think we have to get all in, a, in an uproar and in a flurry of excitement. No, you know what we need to do? We need to stand still. We need to stand still and we need to let the Lord fight for us. Why? Because when God fights for his people, it's a bad day for the enemy. Amen. Well, how do we, how do we stand still? What, what does that look like? Well, the passage continues and we see truth. We see truth. He says in verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth or having put on the girdle or the belt, wrapping it around your waist. Now you'll just notice here that it says stand therefore having. You'll see this word having throughout the passage. Um, you and I cannot stand still if we have not put on the whole armor of God. And so he says, stand therefore having, because you've, because you've girded your waist, because you've put on um, the, around your waist the truth, then this is part of what it takes to be able to stand, to stand still. Um, let's look at the picture of the, the centurion here. Um, this is uh, the belt area, the waist area. And when it says um, having girded, it means to wrap around or to dress oneself. It literally means to make oneself ready. The idea of taking the belt and you wrap it around. When I was in the Marine Corps, I had a belt that all my other gear uh, was attached to. My ammo pouches and my canteens and a, um, a pack in the back with a first aid kit and some other supplies and, and, and a harness that went over my shoulder. It was all together in one place. But, but, I, but I looked at this and I said, well, when it says wrap it around, to wrap it around your waist, why, why the waist? Obviously, that's where it is, but he, he uses this word. And so as I went through and did the word study, here's what the word waste means. Procreative power. Some of you are like, wait, wait, what? Procreative power, reproduction, descendants. He, what he's saying here is, I want you to 
gird, wrap around yourself, wrap around, make yourself ready around your descendants. All of a sudden, this idea of truth takes on a whole nother meaning, doesn't it? It's not just truth for you and for me, but it's turning around and recognizing the responsibility you and I have as having received the truth from God to not only wear it around on our own waist, but to make sure that that is being passed on to our descendants, to future generations as well. Is there anything that our children and our children's children and beyond need more today than truth? Not only is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, we read that in John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said to him, I am the way, there it is, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But truth is something we need to speak daily. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Boy, he starts right off the bat and says, If you have any intentions on standing and standing still, boy, you better have truth wrapped right around you. But I would contend, and you need to make sure you're passing that truth on to future generations as well. Well, he goes on and the next, the next thing that he's teaching us is righteousness. He's teaching us about righteousness. How does righteousness come into play on the battlefield? Well, he says in verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with, the, with truth. And here he says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The word uh, phrase here that says put on, it means to dress, to clothe, it means to wear, to wear. Think about that in terms of righteousness, where to wear it. A uniform, protective uniforms do no good if they're sitting on the corner. We, We have to put those on ourselves. Going back to the picture of the centurion, we see the area of the breastplate. Now, some people, and I've heard this taught before, that the breastplate was only on the front, but that's not true. It was, it was um, either a solid piece of material on the front and a solid piece on the back that then was laced together um, on, on, under the arms and over the shoulders. Um, or it was several pieces that were all woven together so that there could be movement. But the breastplate consisted of two parts, uh, one that covered the front and the other that covered the back as far down, um, as far down and past the vitals in your back. You think of a set of shoulder pads, they go down a certain distance, but then there's other pads that come up across the back to protect kidneys and that kind of stuff as well. The breastplate covers the vitals, the most important, the most important area of a body. It covers, it covers the heart. Well, whose who's righteousness? Is this my righteousness? Is this your righteousness? that we're to put on? No, no. In fact, Isaiah chapter 64 says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquity like the wind have taken us away. When we look at this, it's not your righteousness, it's not mine. And think of this, if our righteousness is as filthy rags, How do we ever put on something good we did to defend us, to protect us as we go into battle? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 makes it clear. It's not our righteousness, but it is the righteousness of Christ. It says, for he made him, he made Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God, not in ourselves, but in him, in Christ. And so as we think about doing spiritual warfare, it's not our righteousness 
that we wear to protect us. No, it's the righteousness of Christ that defeated sin and death. It's his purity and his holiness that protects your heart and protects mine as believers put on the whole armor of God. And so we think of the truth of God that we wrap around our waist, not only is in wrapping Jesus Christ around our waist, and he is the truth, and we pass it on to future generations, but when we speak, everything we do in spiritual warfare is true because I mean, we're coming from a position of truth, and we are being protected because what we're saying is true, and we're being protected by the righteousness of the righteousness of Christ over our vitals. What a picture. The last one we're going to look at today is the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Look at verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having shod your feet, we'll just go right to the picture of the uh, of our soldier. It's a little bit hard to see, but this um, shod, having shod your feet, is having to bind something under one's feet to apply the implements, to put on the implements. One writer said that that this area from your um, from your ankles up to your knees would be covered with either metal or leather and there would be um, nails or spikes sticking out of it. It would be part of not just protection for you, but also an opportunity if somebody got close to you, it could be a weapon that you'd use. But, but, but as you'd have this over your leg, you'd have this over your foot, you'd have this piece of leather or maybe some metal that would be over your foot to protect your foot. Why? So that you'd be able to continue to run and not have to worry about the sticks that, you know, we walk on hot ground or step on a stick in, in the spring when our, our feet are still tender because we haven't gotten our summer uh, feet calloused up yet. I, th I thought of this and that I'm, I'm, sh I'm binding under my feet. I'm preparing them. I'm, I'm making my feet ready. I'm making my mind ready. I'm preparing so that I can go into battle, so I can go out and cover a lot of ground, not tiptoe around, but I'm doing that with the gospel whose message is peace. The, the idea of getting your feet ready, getting your feet prepared so that you can make a good solid stand. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's for the football player putting on your cleats. You'd never go out and play football wearing a pair of uh, smooth bottom tennis shoes. Why? Because you'd get slid all over the place. No, you put something underneath your feet that has some cleats going down in to give you a firm footing, a firm ground to help establish you so that when you are in the middle of the battle, your feet don't slip. What a better, what better picture is there of the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel that gives you peace, that as you have that on and you wear that and you recognize, I stand not in my own ability, but I stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what gives me peace. There is no better foundation, is there? There's no better foundation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it... In what? In the gospel. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. If we want to have a good, firm foundation, it's not just a matter of we get saved at a time in our life and then we go on. Friends, I believe it is each and every day 
we recognize, you know what, this is not my truth that I'm holding on to. The way of a man, you know, seems right in his own eyes, but that way ends in death. It's the truth of God that I want to wrap around my waist. It's not my righteousness. My righteousness is filthy rags. And so each day I put on the righteousness of Christ, protecting my front and my back from attacks from the front and from, from uh, the enemy coming up behind me as well. And then I have on my feet, I have my, my foundation is on the gospel. And each and every day, I don't get re-saved, but I remember and I stand firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God. It's the power of God for salvation. And that is the hope that each one of us have. And so as we go back to verse 13, as we wrap up, verse 13 says, and read this with me. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, today I pray for each one listening, for those who have accepted you as their Savior. Father, I pray that even now they would, as they come before you humbly and through the blood of Jesus Christ, and in his name, we pray, God, that you would equip us with the belt of truth. Remove lying from our mouth and help us to pass on the truth of Jesus Christ to our descendants, to our kids, our grandkids, our nieces and nephews and generations to come. Help us to wear the breastplate of righteousness, realizing and thanking you that it's the, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that protects me. It's not my righteousness. God, put it on me. Help me to put it on and to wear it, but it's not mine. It is from you, and I thank you for that. And I thank you for a firm foundation that the gospel of peace, the gospel brings peace. It gives peace. It establishes peace, and it is the only way we can have peace. And each and every day, may we put on, as we put on our shoes, may we remember we are standing on your gospel the death and the burial and the resurrection, the ascension, the promised return, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And that is the foundation on which we stand. God, for each one of us, help, help us to put on the whole armor that you have given us, that we may be able to withstand in these evil days and having done all to stand. It's by and for and in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Friends, this is Pastor Glenn. As always, thank you for being with us. Remember, continue to read ahead in this chapter of Ephesians chapter 6. What is God teaching you? What is he showing you? And remember, each day, set this out on your kitchen table, on your nightstand, so when you wake up, you begin your day putting on the whole armor of God. And allow, allow that to protect you and guide you as you go throughout your day. Continue to pray for revival. Continue to pray that God would root out the junk in your life and in mine, in our lives, that we would turn to him and praise him for what he is doing in our hearts and lives. And as always, may we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Friends, it's been great to be with you. This is Pastor Glenn from Chapmanville Community Church. Happy Valentine's Day, and until next time, God bless.